Friday, everybody. This is WHCO BO News Talk 1040. I'm your host from 4 to 6, Jeff Dice, sitting in as I frequently do for David Gornowski. Hope you're all having a great Friday. Hope you're all able to enjoy some time off on this beautiful upcoming holiday Memorial Day weekend. A lot happening this week that we have to catch up on. Of course, we will be talking about this terrible shooting which happened at elementary school in Texas earlier this week. Uh, We'll have some friends of the show on to discuss uh, some of the permutations of that terrible event. Our our old friend, Judge Andrew Napolitano, many of you remember him from his years as a Fox News analyst. He's very active today as a legal commenter. So I asked him to join us to talk about some of the Second Amendment considerations that will probably arise when presumably some sort of gun control legislation is enacted either by Congress as part of its grandstanding before the midterm elections or by various states themselves looking to do something about this gun problem that we apparently have in the United States. So I'll look forward to bringing Judge Napolitano on later. I have some really interesting questions for him about the Second Amendment and what's feasible and what's not uh, I think we all understand that these kinds of shootings represent a, a real breakdown in society. In other words, no matter what we do about implements of violence, whether someone's using a hammer or a knife or a so-called assault rifle, the question becomes why are there so many young men seemingly alienated, unhappy, lashing out, even sometimes going so far as to commit mass violence? I mean, that's a real question for society and a real problem for society. And it's one that we don't much like to face. It sounds uh, to feminists anyway, like we're complaining about a war on boys and that men, especially young men, need to man up and take responsibility. Well, at the end of the day, the shooter himself is responsible for this terrible event. Nobody else. Uh, Not his parents, not his absent father, apparently, um, although that doesn't help. Uh, Not his teachers, not his classmates who apparently may have poked fun at him, uh, certainly not the gun manufacturer, and ultimately not even the feckless SWAT police uh, in Texas who failed to stop him, apparently for quite some time after he entered the school. None of those people are ultimately responsible for his choices, his actions on this fateful day earlier this week. But nonetheless, Whether he's responsible or not, the rest of us are left with the idea of how can we better provide physical security, for example, for young people in schools? How better can we provide um, mental health help for young people who appear to be in trouble? And how does all this factor into some sort of federal database or something like that, which is obviously going to be proposed? There's no question about that. But um, I oppose anything like that. I don't even support the existing federal background check, which, by the way, apparently this young man passed. He had turned 18, which was one requirement for purchasing long rifles and so-called assault rifles. But what these really were, we're told anyway, uh, are semi-automatic AR-15 rifles, widely available, uh, hugely popular in the United States. Really kind of a not a heavy caliber, but more of a light arm But nonetheless, um, a lot of different manufacturers, Chinese and otherwise, making guns on the AR-15 platform, and lots of people have them. They're quite popular in the United States, but they are not machine guns. They are not assault rifles in the sense that they are not fully automatic weapons. And again, the caliber is not that big. Uh, These are weapons where you you pull the trigger um, in bursts, and that's how you fire the weapon, but it does not fire automatically. It fires semi-automatically. So I think that's that's a point in this assault rifle debate because we can't quite manage to figure out what is an assault rifle. And I think what most people, if, especially our gun-controlling friends on the left, think an assault rifle is, is a military-style or a military-grade weapon. And the, the AR-15 is not exactly that, but it could be used for those purposes. So they have a point. They certainly have a point. And they point to Europe, for example, and say, hey, look, there are uh, unhappy young people in Europe. There are alienated young men. There are people with mental health issues, but they never seem to have these mass shootings simply because the guns themselves, the, the implements are not widely available 
in society in most European countries. And the only people who might be able to touch something like this would be, a, let's say, a military personnel or a police personnel. And because of that, these troubled people are not able to carry out the kind of carnage, the kind of numbers we've seen in some of these mass shootings in the United States. And that's true. That's fair enough. I mean, uh, a semi-automatic rifle really does uh, escalate the ability that uh, a single individual has to harm a, a bunch of people quickly, especially in a group setting. That's true. That's a fact. Uh, as opposed to what they might do with a knife, for example, or a baseball bat or some other implement of violence. But that does not address some of the underlying questions, which is, which are, what kind of society do we want to have in the United States with respect to self-defense and firearm ownership? What does the Second Amendment mean in the United States? How is our history different from Europe? How are our um, values different from Europe? How is our political system different? What would it take for people on the left to change the Second Amendment? For example, I'll be talking to Judge Knapp about just that. So these are all questions that we're struggling with in the aftermath of a, a horrific crime like this. And then on top of it all, to compound matters, we are starting slowly to find out that there was gross police malfeasance at the scene. Not only does it appear that responding officers did not rush in uh, and put their own lives on the line, at least in any great numbers, to try to stop this young man on his killing spree, but that they may have actually held people outside and prevented parents from going in and trying to do so unarmed themselves. I mean, any parent arriving at that school after hearing notice of, uh, of this event happening in real time would pr probably gladly rush in there without a gun even and try to tackle or stop this young man. That would be a very natural parental impulse. And it looks like the police thwarted that by restraining people outside from going into the school. So that's, you know, we're going to find out more about that. That's going to unfold over the next few days. And we got to be careful about indicting anyone because sometimes there's almost the fog of war surrounding these events. We find out in dribs and drabs what actually happened. And maybe a week later, our understanding and perception of the event is quite a bit different than it was at the time when the event was fresh. But nonetheless, um, you know, those early impressions tend to stick. And right now, those early impressions uh, with our left-wing friends is that we got to get these guns out of society. And the impression on the right is that police didn't do their job and that school or some personnel there should have provided better security to stop this terrible killing in its tracks. So that's going to be one of the big focuses of our show today, but there are others as well. We're going to be talking about what's going on in Davos in Switzerland amongst our betters at the World Economic Forum. So a little lighter. We're going to take a quick commercial break. This is News Talk 1040 across Tampa and Central Florida. I'm your host, Jeff Deist. Happy Friday afternoon. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Jeff Deist. Uh, and as most of you know, my employer, the Mises Institute, is your online home for everything about economics and politics and political theory that you need. Check out Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S.org, for some great takes from our editor, Ryan McMakin, on this shooting and some of the statistics behind gun violence in the United States. He'll join us later in the program after Judge Napolitano. So Ryan's really one of the best social commentators out there. Somebody you're going to want to check out at Mises.org on our site. So I recommend you do that. Now, before we get any further into this Texas school shooting, I want to talk a little bit about what has been happening in Davos, which is a very, very, very ritzy town 
in Switzerland, where once a year, the World Economic Forum meets for its annual meeting. And this is touted by a lot of people as, you know, a meeting of the elites, people who are in the billionaire class and the super elite class, people who hope to shape the future and not always uh, with the interests of average people or the little guy in mind. And that's uh, probably true to an extent. But if you've been following it all, following along at all, you'll see that the WBF is pretty open compared to some of the other uh, more secretive meetings that occur around the world. In other words, they publish their list of attendees. You can Google who attended it, and a lot of them are not necessarily particularly rich or elite themselves. They may work at universities or big companies or in governmental positions, but it doesn't mean that they are all uh, billionaires like Bill Gates or Elon Musk or something like that. Uh, you know, quite the contrary. But nonetheless, the World Economic Forum is expressly designed to talk about the future in a way that uh, ignores the idea of national sovereignty. And that's what's really changed over, let's say, the last 20 or 30 years. We talk about globalism, and we think of that in terms of trade. We think of that in terms of U.S. influence on politics uh, and, and foreign policy. But there's really two different things at work when we talk about globalism. Well, one is natural and organic, and one is very unnatural and imposed. So I would argue that Davos and the World Economic Forum represents the latter. In other words, this is globalism that is being dictated to us and is being imposed upon us, and that the people involved in it don't much care about, let's say, the political or legislative or legal processes in any of the individual nations involved in the forum, like the United States. And the WEF is just an NGO. It's a non-governmental organization. It's not a uh, it's not the UN, it's not the WHO, it's not the IMF or any of these other groups. It just has volunteer uh, membership. It doesn't have any legal authority to do anything. So it's really just a bunch of globalists and elites getting together to talk about the future that they believe that they are shaping and driving themselves. And what they don't much talk about is the sovereignty of the countries they would like to change. In other words, the United States, um, they don't much care about our treaty process. They didn't much like it when Donald Trump was elected. They uh, undoubtedly think our electoral college is a hindrance to progress and should be done away with. Uh, but nonetheless, they're not asking. In other words, when the WEF uh, event happens in Davos, they're not sitting around going like, well, we'd like to do this if – uh, the, the voters of the United States or any other country are, are willing to go along with it. They're not asking, they're telling. They're saying this is the future. We, meaning Davos elites, are shaping the future. This is how it's going to be. The question is just what it takes to get these recalcitrants to go along with it. So it's interesting that the tone and tenor has shifted you know, 20 or 30 years ago when we, we were looking at things in this country like the NAFTA and GATT trade agreements – the GATT agreement created the WTO. Some of you might remember that from the early 90s, the World Trade Organization. You know, back then, there was still the idea that uh, individual countries had to approve these deals, sometimes as a treaty, sometimes just as a bill, uh, and that there needed to be democratic participation on the national level, on the sovereign state level, to make these things happen. You don't hear as much about that today. And I think that's a real shift and uh, a radical one and a telling one. So globalism has two different ways of looking at it. One of them is inorganic and imposed like the WEF. But the other side of globalism is actually something that happens through uh, trade and through just the self-interest of people around the world trading with each other. Because every, every place you go on earth, people are different. They have specializations. They have comparative advantage. And that makes it useful uh, to exchange w with them for either using money or goods and services, depending on which way that trade is going. And so, you know, in the United States, we fret about uh, the effects of globalism sometimes, and we worry about what it means for U.S. manufacturing jobs, and we have a sort of a protectionist outlook fre frequently. Trump certainly did. And we say, well, gee whiz, what's this doing to uh, towns like Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, which once had Bethlehem Steel, when we have all this free trade and do away with deal tariffs on imports, that sort of thing. But nonetheless, uh, Americans have benefited enormously, hugely, 
from importing cheap stuff from around the world. I mean, if you go to Walmart, uh, virtually everything you're buying in there, except for the food products, is, is almost certainly imported and a lot of it from China. Now, that's changing a bit. China, in turn, is is not is no longer the cheapest manufacturing spot. It used to be that U.S. companies offshored their manufacturing to China because it was cheap. And now China faces competitions from places like Sri Lanka and India and Vietnam and Mexico. So the process continues. But nonetheless, I mean, sending people dollars in exchange for cheap stuff, especially when those dollars, as we now know, are rapidly losing value, that's, a, that's been a good deal for Americans. Dollars for stuff. Maybe we have too much stuff in our garages and attics and closets, but nonetheless, it has been a good deal, and it's made a lot of uh, things available to people in the middle and lower income brackets, things that used to be available only to the rich, uh, certain electronics, certain jewelry, certain uh, you know, travel, all kinds of things have come way down in price, and that's not entirely, but in large part due to globalization, global trade. So this, this is the kind of... Uh, voluntary globalism, the kind of uh, economic globalism, which I think in a digital interconnected world would happen even without governments mucking about. The other kind, the Davos kind, is political globalism. So w one way we might consider economic globalism is, is, here's an example, virtually anywhere you go on Earth, sub-Saharan Africa, the, you know, deep into the Amazon jungle, any city, any country, any town, uh, they probably have Diet Coke, <laughs> okay? Diet Coke is a global product, a universal product. It is everywhere. You can go to ask a, uh, you know, an indigenous person uh, somewhere along the Amazon, you know, show them a can of Diet Coke. You, you, Diet Coke, probably not along. Um, so that's an example of good globalism, in my opinion. In other words, people like Diet Coke, no matter where you go, people like it, and therefore they voluntarily want it, and therefore it makes sense for the Coca-Cola people to make that available everywhere. That's a business thing that's voluntary, and to me, um, people benefit from that because they they want Diet Coke. But the political side of globalism, I think, is very, very different and not so welcome. It's imposed on us, folks. We didn't vote for it. We didn't ask for it. The people we elect to office didn't sign off on a treaty, which, by the way, requires two-thirds of the Senate. That's why a lot of this stuff is now done by simple legislation rather than treaty, and they call it an agreement rather than a treaty. But let me give you a quick example of what I mean by this kind of political globalism. When Dr. Ron Paul was in Congress in uh, the 1990s and early 2000s, Everyone was talking about the World Trade Organization. You know, this is great. This is free trade. Ron Paul's a libertarian. He's for free trade, right? The Cato Institute is telling us, oh, free trade's great. It's going to lower tariffs, and there's going to be uh, uh, more goods and services crossing borders. We're all going to be wealthier. And there was some truth to that, but here was the, the dark side of the WTO, is that when Congress passed the GATT bill in 94, which created the WTO, um, it also set up what was called an appellate panel to, to deal with disputes between trading nations. And so pretty soon the Europeans uh, ganged up on the United States before this board, this adjudicated board, kind of like a court, and said, you know, the way you guys tax your foreign corporations, in other words, subsidiary corporations owned by a U.S. parent corporation, the way you tax that, that's, that shouldn't be allowed um, you don't tax that income till it's brought home in the form of a dividend. So that's a subsidy. You're subsidizing your uh, domestic corporations and their foreign subsidiaries through your tax treatment. And you've got to change that. And remember, this is after everyone in Washington was telling us this is just free trade. There's no impact on sovereignty. The WTO can't make us change our laws. But nonetheless, when... The United States lost that appeal in front of the WTO appellate panel. Uh, they came back to Congress, and these very powerful people in Congress just sort of shrugged and said, well, I guess we got to change the law because the appellate panel said that we, we're engaged in an illegal subsidy. In other words, our domestic tax laws, which members of Congress voted on, the same people you sent or, or, one, or our grandparents or somebody sent to Congress, even though they voted on these things, 
we have to change them at the behest of the WTO because the WTO is telling us they're illegal. Not that they violate the terms of our trade agreement. That's not the language used. They said they were illegal subsidies. And in the early 2000s, the Ways and Means Committee in the U.S. House went ahead and changed that rule dealing with foreign subsidiary corporations called FSCs, foreign sales corporations and tax lingo. Now, that's an example, folks, a small one, but an important one of how you as average people had the right to affect the laws under which you're supposed to live attenuated and taken away from you and sent off to a global body which you didn't vote for and which your elected representatives didn't vote for. So when we come back, we're going to talk more about this political globalism, what's happening this past week at the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, where there's a lot of private jets pulling up to a lot of expensive hotels one week every year. We're going to have Jonathan Newman, one of the great economists here at the Mises Institute, has been following this, the WEF. He's going to join us to talk about it. They put out a, a report. The Economist at the WF called the Chief Economist Outlook. So we're going to take a look at that. we got to take a quick commercial break. This is News Talk 1040. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Everybody to the show. Happy Friday afternoon. Hope you're all going to have a great holiday weekend and hope a lot of you anyway have Monday off to enjoy and get rested up after this grim week in the news. And it wasn't grim only because of this terrible shooting in Texas. There's also something pretty grim going on in Davos in Switzerland, in my opinion anyway. The World Economic Forum annual meeting and here to help me discuss this with you is our great friend, Dr. Jonathan Newman, who's a professor of economics in Tennessee and also a fellow here at the Mises Institute. Jonathan, it is great to hear from you. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, this is interesting, this uh, new kind of globalism, which is happening. I noticed you tweeted the other day, uh, Klaus Schwab, who is an economist, although a uh, uh, engineer by training, who is the head of of the World Economic Forum, he basically, they tweeted a keynote speech from him saying the future is being built by us. And when I saw that, you know, I think of uh, Friedrich Hayek's idea of uh, spontaneous order and and distributed knowledge. And yet here we've got what sounds to me, what sure smacks like central planning. Yeah, you're right. So with uh, Klaus Schwab basically congratulating himself and the rest of the audience saying that the future is built by us, that we're basically in control, and we, we're designing what the future will look like when it comes to technology and policy and food and energy and monetary policy and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but the point that I wanted to make was just that the, the future is actually built by regular people. It's built by moms and dads raising their kids the right way. It's built by entrepreneurs who are – they're the ones who are you know taking the risk. They're the ones who – you know, have their own uh, assets on the line when they're trying to guess what consumers need in the future. Um, And and so it's built by all these, like, regular people who are doing their jobs. It's not built by this, this, you know, group of elites who are, uh, I mean, it's a a public meeting, but, you know, they're sort of, uh, they're squirreled away over in this, you know, very nice, uh, city, very nice area in the, in Europe with the nice hotels, and they all flew there by private jet. So they're, I, I would say that they're very far removed from the the people and the areas that are actually driving uh, what makes the, the world turn around. Yeah, far removed is right. Wow. But what's interesting, Jonathan, is they're not really hiding it any longer. They're not pretending to be connected uh, to their own national uh, passport issuing home countries. They're not really pretending to be connected to average people. I mean, they talk a little bit about desperately poor people in Africa, and they talk a lot about what global elites might do, but you get a sense that they don't really care, to put it mildly, about 
what average people, the kind of people listening to the show today, uh, might have as their own concerns in their own uh, sovereign countries. You're right. What you hear from the sound bites from this meeting is, I mean, there's lots of scary stuff or things that would be scary for a normal audience. People talking about like nanotechnology that can confirm that a certain vaccine or certain, you know, uh, set of medications have been taken uh, in future pandemics. People talking about, uh, quote, recalibrating the freedom of speech and all these sorts of, you know, weird things uh, that, that that should that would frighten you know regular people, but it's so interesting to see them say these sorts of things on the stage, and the people that are on the stage with them, they just sort of nod along, they just sort of go along with it. Oh yeah, that seems like a nice idea, and and of course the reason is is because they they sort of view themselves as being detached from any of the costs that would be associated with with the implementation of their policies or implementation of of what they want the world to look like. So since they, they're sort of, uh, like we said, detached from the rest of the world, they, they're not the ones who would bear the cost of any of the things that would be uh, put in place, any, anything that would be implemented from, from their deliberations, from their, from their forum. So I think, I think they're, they're separated, and I think that your uh, distinction is a good one because there's, there's really two different kinds of globalism, like you said. There's this political globalism and there's this economic globalism. And despite their name, the World Economic Forum, there's really not much economic about it. A lot of it is just, you know, daydreaming about what technology can look like in the future. A lot of it is just, you know, you know, patting themselves on the back. A lot of it is is recommending certain policies uh, be implemented. But not a lot of it is, you know, good old-fashioned economics. A lot of it is just these top-down, we should do things this way, we know what's best for everybody. It's not the good sort of globalism, uh, like you said, that takes advantage of people's uh, different skills that are the different uh, productivities around the world. You know, certain regions are good at producing certain goods and, and other regions are better at producing other goods. So the good sort of globalism takes advantage of those, of those differences in, in skills and in, in climate and all that sort of stuff so that, so that we have a lot of, a lot of, uh, economic growth, a lot of uh, stuff that we can share and trade um, around the world. But this this type of globalism is a top-down, coerced, paternalistic type of globalism that they just want uni- uniformity, but they want uniformity to look in the way that they want it to look. Well, Jonathan, what I so strongly object to is this idea that average people won't own much because these elites at Davos, they own a lot. And, and even if that just means stock shares or whatever they own, um, but capital accumulation and allowing for average people in a society, even lower income people, to own perhaps some real estate, to own a home, to own some investments. I mean, that's really what distinguishes, in my view anyway, uh, you know, a healthy, uh, what we think of as the Western world versus the more impoverished parts of the world. So this, this idea that we're not going to own anything and that we're all going to sort of exist in this deracinated uh, state is really pretty frightening to me. It's strange because you would think that, so they see the sorts of things that are happening in the world. They see the pandemic. They see uh, big, great powers invading other countries. And they see all of the turmoil that that can cause. And in fact, they acknowledge that in their uh, report, in their chief economist outlook, they talk about all of the, all of the uncertainty and, and all of the things that, that caused their prior predictions to, to not go to, to, uh, as planned or to not come true. And it seems to me that like there's a very easy answer to all of this. And the answer is, as you said, capital accumulation. Like People need to own things. People need to have reserves. People need to have, you know, their rainy day fund. They need to have their savings. Yet all of the policies that are proposed by the WEF or their projections about people owning nothing, as well as, you know, people who are in a similar group, like the central bankers around the world, everything that they do discourages saving. It encourages consumption and living for the moment. There's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of, uh, like, long time horizon planning uh, there's there's a lot of people who are, you know, they live day to day, they live paycheck to paycheck. And the reason why is because the powers that be have incentivized a lifestyle like that. But what would what would be best 
especially in times where we have pandemics and lockdowns and and war a- across the world. What would be best is if people did have that sort of resilience in the form of good old-fashioned savings, whether monetarily or in the form of goods. So I think that there's a lot of, you know, it's just good old-fashioned common sense. It seems that we've forgotten because we're, you know, we're too focused on what the future can look like technologically. Right. And, of course, ownership and skin in the game and having children, which let's just say the WEF does not particularly encourage amongst the plebes. You know, ownership is what creates a, a more stable society that's better for children when people feel like they have something to lose and something to uh, fight to maintain as opposed to a you know, highly transient um, society where nobody owns anything. I mean, this, it, the, what's so scary here, I guess, to me is how blasé they are about the more civilizational, let's say, aspects of upending life as we know it. Another thing that struck me from Klaus Schwab's uh, remarks um, was that he he mentioned that what was needed for the future to be built by them in a, in a successful sort of way, I can't remember exactly how he phrased it, but what was needed was stakeholder responsibility and collaboration. Those were the two you know key points from the little snippet that I saw. And what struck me is that those two things are indeed extremely important. So we have we have a stakeholder responsibility in a private property order in, in which you know we have rule of law, we have contracts, we have you know um, basically laissez-faire policy. We have people who they are the ones who are on the line for the choices that they make uh, for their business. They're on the line for the choices that they make for their families, and so we we already have stakeholder responsibility distributed to all of the people where it matters if we have, you know, unfettered, laissez-faire capitalism, which which would be, you know, what I would say is a better way to to, uh, arrange the world compared to what Klaus Schwab would have. But the other thing he said was a collaboration. And so not not only do we have stakeholder responsibility in capitalism and free markets, but we also have tons and tons of collaboration. Uh, you've already mentioned F.A. Hayek, but there's also uh, great works by uh, um, uh, Leonard Reed. He wrote this uh, great uh, short work called I Pencil. And, and both Hayek and R- Reed would point out that pretty much the production of anything in the market economy requires tons and tons of collaboration. It requires tons and tons of coordinated activity between employees and employers and consumers and producers. And they're all they're all self-organizing in a spontaneous sort of way. And and it's collaborative because people aren't forcing others to, to do their will. So for, for somebody to work in a pencil factory, you don't have to enslave them. You don't have to hold them at gunpoint. If you just pay them a wage, then they're willing to work for you um, and, and do the job that they're good at doing. And so we have we already have this theory and we already have you know, the experience that shows us that market economies have the stakeholder responsibility they have the collaboration and so for him to get up there and say that what's needed for for their uh for their project to be successful to build the future among all of these powerful elites that were in the room with them for him to say that it just seems strange for me because i'm i'm looking at it from the perspective of well it seems like you know just a regular old market economy has those two those two things what are you up to if you think that mm-hmm. what what is needed at in these big in these big meetings where you need the same sorts of things? Folks, we gotta take a quick break. We are talking about Davos, the World Economic Forum, what they have planned for us with Professor Jonathan Newman. This is News Talk Ted Forty. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Often do for David Gordoski, Neighbor's Choice. We're talking to Professor Jonathan Newman, 
of the Mises Institute. Also a friend of mine about what's happening at the World Economic Forum this past week. You know, Jonathan, the WF puts out the Chief Economist Outlook, and you can go to their website and find it, folks. It's a 24-page PDF. It's available to anybody. I was struck by the fact that it's pretty sober in its assessment. Coming out of COVID and all the lockdowns, there are significant supply chain issues around the world. And also there are uh, headwinds in the form of monetary and fiscal profligacy, which have happened, especially in the Western countries, uh, since COVID hit. And as a result of this, they're not painting a particularly rosy picture of the world, at least in the short term. You're right. One uh, other thing that struck me about the report is that the uh, they actually mentioned the uncertainty surrounding all of their forecasting, which is something that's uh, sort of surprising because I'm used to reading uh, uh, or listening to Federal Reserve announcements or, or other agencies of the U.S. federal government and they, they've always got their projections. They've always got their predictions about what the future will hold. And, of course, it's, it's actually quite comical to see how far off they are, even for some of the things that are their own policy variables. So it was, it was quite uh, uh, refreshing for me, I guess, in, in one sense, to see uh, that they actually acknowledge that there's uncertainty about uh, the future, acknowledge that they, they could be wrong and that a lot of the things that are going on in the world today actually add to the uncertainty. In fact, one of the first things that they mentioned was that they they were significantly off from their uh, from their predictions or projections uh, uh, a year ago. The other thing that stood out to me from this report, um, and and I think uh, you've discussed this as well, is the fact that they mentioned uh, trade offs. Uh, that was also uh, quite refreshing. So they actually talked about the limitations of fiscal policy. Actually, they actually mentioned that the U.S. government could be uh, constrained by by inflation. Uh, that they would be, they wouldn't be able to, you know, just keep spending as much as they want to because they're constrained by, by how much inflation there is. So there's that, but there are also other uh, types of trade-offs that they mentioned. Of course, a lot of the trade-offs were uh, based on policy, but they also mentioned trade-offs based on just energy use. So that was that was also refreshing to hear because once again, I'm used to, I'm used to listening to you know the MMTers or the the AOCs of the world that that. Can, dream and think that we can, you know, just do everything and anything, and there's no cost to it. There's no, you know, there's no foregone end. There's no, there's nothing that's that, that we have to go without because we've pursued, you know, some sort of policy. So those two things I would say were are at least somewhat refreshing to see um, in, a, in a report like this where they mentioned that there's some uncertainty, but they also acknowledged the fact of, of trade-offs. Well, what's interesting is when you talk about shocks to the system, whether that's a virus of course, in our opinion, the reaction of the virus was wildly overdone. But nonetheless, a virus, uh, an invasion of Ukraine by Putin, some sort of economic shock, a terrorist incident, a financial crisis like 2007, 2008. You get this sense, Jonathan, that all of these things that might happen, all this trouble in the world, is their justification for why you need them. In other words, somebody needs to be steering the globalist ship. It can't just organize itself. That was a that was a, a theme in the report. They talked about how a lot of these crises around the world were basically forcing countries to look inward, to to be more localized, to to uh, basically cling to their own sovereignty more than they otherwise would. And that was that was viewed as a downside from the perspective of the people who put this report together. And the reason it's a downside for them is because that would only limit their ability to. To you know, to shape uh, universal, uniform, international uh, policy uh, from their perspective. So, if if countries are are looking inside, if they're being more insular because of all of the crises and the uncertainty around the world, that actually prevents them from doing the sorts of things that they want. But I mean, at least it was good to see that acknowledged. At least that they're acknowledging that there is such a thing as as national sovereignty. If you look at the people who are there, a, a lot of them they they don't even seem like they're they're citizens of a particular country. They, they seem like uh, purely international people, purely international citizens, citizens of the world. You know that they're not they're not beholden to any set of laws. They they can sort of think and dream and talk in such a way where where there's no limitation. There's no bill of rights that that would constrain what a government can t- can do to somebody. Uh, there's no there's no constraint at all in in the 
the sorts of technological dreaming that they can do. There's there's no room for a citizen to stand up and say, no, I have a right to to my own body. I have a right to privacy. I, I don't I don't want this sort of thing. So it's sort of interesting to see that dynamic as well. Well, Jonathan, as long as you have a fractional jet ownership share and, and let's say, a special <laughs> gold card at the Four Seasons, there's one of those just about in every place that our globalist friends would like to stay. There's not one in Auburn, Alabama, necessarily, but, you know, uh, in bigger cities. But what struck me is the section on the U.S. dollars, the world's reserve currency, which, of course, benefits us as Americans enormously uh, in, in many ways allows us to live, us meaning our federal government, to live beyond its means, to, in other words, export inflation, essentially. Now, that's a topic for a different show. But what I guess saddened me was this idea that these bad events in the world, something like COVID, something like Putin's invasion of Ukraine, are, are good for the U.S. dollar because the dollar is perceived to be the strongest currency and thus when people when people feel imperiled or uncertain, they tend to uh, want to hold in U.S. dollars, and which of course strengthens that dollar in terms of foreign exchange trading. So it's it, it really is something the way that uh, the, the dollar manages to just survive and thrive. Only time will tell what will happen in the future, though. So the, one thing that they mentioned in the report is that uh, there's been a a slight decrease in dollar holdings around the world as a reserve currency. I, I can't remember the exact exact numbers, but something like 70 down to 59. Yeah, there it is right there, uh, 70 percent uh, down to 59 percent. Uh, and that was uh, from the start of the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944 um, at, uh, down, down to currently 59 percent. So there's been some sort of decrease. A lot of that has been some uh, because of diversification. People are going into the euro and going into the yen using those as uh, as sort of safe haven type assets as well so that they don't have all of their eggs in, in one uh, U.S. basket. But what's, what's interesting, what we haven't seen over that entire period from 1944 to present is, you know, the full flourishing of the cryptocurrency or to see what will happen to, uh, to Bitcoin. Um, I, I'm not in a position to say one way or another, but it will be interesting to see how central banks respond to that. Are we going to see a digital dollar? Um, Are we going to see, you know, the state finally take control over the the currency in the form of a, of a central bank governed cryptocurrency. So it'll be interesting to see how that happens. But a, a lot of, like, like you said, a lot of what is driving this, this slight movement away from the U S dollar is uh, the, all the geopolitics of the world. So I think Russia has been gearing up for the last few years for these this sort of conflict where they're not so beholden to, to U.S.-based assets. They've been diversifying for years. And, and of course, a lot of, uh, a lot of the sanctions have you know, pushed them closer to China um, in terms of trade and, and the assets that are, that are going between those two countries. So it'll be interesting to see what the future holds uh, can we can we have more peace around the world? Uh, what will cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin look like? Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what happens in terms of dollar holdings around the world. In the two minutes we have left, I want your take on this, Jonathan. I wonder if if the Davos set views COVID as a failure because international bodies and international elites like them were unable to project much authority and so most countries sort of lapsed back into nationalist approaches to how to treat COVID rather than one global approach i think you're right i think they do view that as a as a failure now there has been there have been a few countries that that were very good about uh well i guess that depends on your perspective about uh, getting all of their citizens on board with vaccines and, and locking everybody down. Uh, but there were other countries where uh, their governments either didn't impose those sorts of things or, or they just were unsuccessful in doing so. Um, and so I think that the WEF crowd would view that as a, as a failure. I think their dream, if, if you can sort of collect what, what you hear from the sound bites uh, from the different speakers, I think their dream is complete surveil- uh, surveillance. Their dream is complete compliance. They want, they want as soon as the the official experts uh, come up with a vaccine or, or some sort of, of course of action, they want everybody to comply um, around the world simultaneously. Um, and I think that would be their dream. So the fact that 
with COVID that didn't happen, they would say that, that what happened was, was a failure. Now, at the same time, it might have been a failure in that respect, but they're also going to take advantage of it. You know, they're the, the sort of group that would uh, never let a crisis go to waste. So they're going to use all of the possible uh, negative outcomes of, of the pandemic to be able to show everybody, see, this is why we need vaccines. This is why we need lots of authority with central governments to, to lock people down so that we can limit the spread of viruses when they come up so that we can so that we can have, you know, the complete control that we need to, to stop these sorts of things from happening. So I well, think in that sense, uh, they view it as a, as a, as a, probably like a springboard or something that they can, can look to in the future uh, and remind everybody, this is why you need us. That's what they say. show everybody this is news talk 1040 i'm your host jeff dice very very pleased to welcome a friend of mine an old friend of the show judge andrew napolitano back to discuss this terrible shooting in texas this week and its implications perhaps for the second amendment judge it's great to talk to you. i wish you, it was jeff. under different circumstances yes well, it's always good to talk to you, no matter what we're uh, we're discussing. You know, it's a tragedy of monumental proportions, but we can't use we can't be like Rahm Emanuel advised: never let a tragedy go to waste when you want to change the law. We can't we we can't do that because the right to keep and bear arms is a a natural right, b a fundamental liberty, c expressly protected by the Constitution. You know. There's going to be a lot of talk about background checks and databases, which we already have. We have a national system of background checks, which this young man apparently passed, uh, having to wait until his 18th birthday to purchase the rifle. But here's my question, Judge, is do we really want to start storing psychological profiles of millions of Americans in a federal database? I sure as hell don't. Well, I've opposed uh, background checks for years for... Uh, a more ominous reason, which is whenever the great dictators took over in, in Europe in the 20th century, the first thing they did was look up and see who, who had guns so they could go and confiscate them. It's none of the government's business that you own a gun, just like it's none of the government's business that you own a, a desktop or a, or a printer or, or a scanning machine. The Second Amendment has to have the same protections as the first. However, storing personal information about people is a recipe for abuse. Now, Joe Biden and his friends have been calling for uh, federal background checks for years. This kid would have passed. You don't need one in Texas to buy a uh, to buy a rifle. Handgun, the law is different. To buy a rifle, you don't need one. If there were a background check, there was nothing in his background that would have prevented him from uh, purchasing this weapon. So we, we know that background checks are just pabulum. They just are, are make the liberals feel good because you're doing something involved with the government. They're dangerous for the reasons that I articulated. A monster running the government will know who to send his people after, and they don't keep anybody safe. The government can't keep you safe. Look at how, how a Keystone cop-like these police officers were until the feds showed up, and then they wouldn't even let the feds in the building for 20 minutes. Hmm. You know, let's just take a hypothetical in terms of the people who believe in a background system. You know, let's say a young person, in this case, said something untoward, something worrisome, or posted something worrisome on social media about wanting to kill people. Let's say they said this to a parent, to a friend, to a teacher, to a therapist, whomever. I mean, how would we ever envision you know, uh, who would then report that? To whom would they report it? How would it be collected and stored and held? Who would assess that information? Maybe it was just an offhand joke or maybe it was a serious comment. Who would then act on that information to deny a gun purchase? I mean, this is almost 
unbelievably complex. It's being presented as some sort of simple panacea. Well, I, I would like for you to cross-examine with that wonderful series of questions you just put, uh, Senator Chris Murphy, who's a Democrat, and I know him, he's a decent guy. He's a fanatic on this subject, though. He's the Democrats' point person uh, on guns. He's the one that's negotiating with Senator John Cornyn of Texas, supposedly to find something that the Republicans can be in favor of. I can't imagine a, a national database or a national background check passing for the very reasons that you just articulated, and maybe for the reason uh, that I uh, articulated. I mean, suppose Joe Biden decides to tell the uh, uh, Bureau of Alcohol to go on firearms to promulgate a regulation limiting the amount of rounds uh, that you can buy. And, and su- suppose I am, because I have a friend who owns a, a gun shop, able to buy more rounds. If they found that out, they would give themselves the power to come and either take the rounds or take the weapons away from me. They will know exactly who I am, exactly what I own, and exactly what I bought, because at least in New Jersey, all of that, including the rounds you buy, has to be recorded by the seller and sent to the government. Now, what they do with that, God only knows. What they can do with it is to strip us of our rights when they want to. You know, the whole purpose of of the Bill of Rights is to protect fundamental liberties. You don't need a bureaucrat's permission to exercise your First Amendment rights. You shouldn't need a bureaucrat's permission to exercise your Second Amendment rights. So at the federal level, these kinds of restrictions, not confiscation, not bans, but these kind of restrictions, let's say, on ammo or magazines or whatever it might be, uh, how do you think federal courts would look at these under the current precedents? I, I, well, I, I, I wish you would ask me that question in about three weeks, <laughs> because the Supreme Court of the United States, which in, in my view is far more pro-gun than the circuit courts and the district courts, but the Supreme Court of the United States has before it New York's uh, law, which makes it nearly impossible to satisfy a bureaucrat that you are entitled to carry in I think they're going to invalidate that law. In doing so, they're going to have to craft some sort of a test or some sort of a bright line uh, below which the states can go, but beyond which they can't, and they will set that out. Uh, and, and the federal courts and the state courts and the state legislatures will have to follow it. Where it is, I don't know. I happen to know that a member of the Supreme Court carries. I don't want to say who it is, but I know this person carries and this person qualifies on a regular uh, basis. So it's not just an affectation on this person's hip or on this person's ankle. This person, this justice, truly knows how to use a handgun, if God forbid it's necessary for the justice to use it. We have just over a minute before the break. Is there a distinction in jurisprudence between the right to possess a firearm generally and the right to carry or have one on one's person out and about? I mean, how did this distinction come to pass? Because I know in New Jersey, uh, it's very difficult, for example, to get a concealed carry permit. Yes, unfortunately, there is a distinction, and the the distinction is articulated in the Heller decision, which only allows you to possess and carry in your home which includes your front yard and your backyard, but it does not include your neighbor's yard or the sidewalk or the front of the house or or where you go to work. That's why this issue of you can own and carry in the home, under what circumstances can you own and carry outside the home? That is the very issue before the Supreme Court upon which it will rule before the end of next month. Well, there's a lot going on here and a lot to digest, folks, and there's certainly going to be pressure put on legislators to appear like they're doing something. But here's the thing. When we act out emotionally in response to some horrific event like this, we tend to make bad decisions that are not well thought through, and those bad decisions tend to have unintended consequences down the line. If you Stick with us. When we come back, we're going to talk more to... Judge Andrew Napolitano about the Second Amendment itself and what the left 
our great friends might want to do about it. This is News Talk 1040. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Friday before this holiday weekend. Hope you have a chance to relax. We are speaking with Judge Andrew Napolitano about this event in Texas. Judge, I want to give you a hypothetical, and I know the answer. I know your answer. I know you too well. <laughs> well, Judge, but, but Judge, please how long indulge. We've been working together. We know we know the way each other thinks. But I'm happy please to indulge. Judge, I'm happy for the challenge. Sure. You don't like guns. You're for gun control. We've got Heller. We've got other interpretations of the Second Amendment. There are means under the Constitution, mechanisms to amend it. You, get, you need supermajorities in the House and Senate or in the state legislatures. But nonetheless, in theory, in theory, the Second Amendment could be revoked. In theory, the Second Amendment could have language added to it to say that the rel- well-regulated militia language does not confer an individual right to possess. It could even be amended to say that the amendment itself excludes uh, some, you know, broad, vague category of weapons of war, military-style weapons or something like that. And they've never done that. So the question, Judge, is why? Why have they never amended or repealed the Second Amendment? Well, because there's not the national consensus to do so, not, notwithstanding the polls and notwithstanding... Uh, what the Democrats uh, want. I mean, for many, many years, the federal interpretation by which the states were bound of the Second Amendment was that the uh, well-regulated militia language trumped the second part of the amendment, and therefore it only conferred the right on a militia, which in the old days was just a, a, a group of uh, farmers and their weapons, which today is the National Guard. Justice uh, Scalia and a majority of the court made it clear that it confers a natural right. But I'll, I'll, I'll take this hypothetical. Well, before I do that, the mechanism for amending the Constitution is so intentionally burdensome, it's hard to believe that even the most ardent gun control people, like my friend Senator Chris Murphy, uh, would believe that there was a, a chance of that happening and the expenditure of time and, and money uh, to achieve it is something that they wouldn't do if they didn't think they had a shot at doing it. So when I was teaching law school using the First Amendment, I would say, if the states repealed the First Amendment, do we still have the freedom of speech? Now, the answer is, Do you believe in positivism or do you believe in the natural law? Positivism teaches that the law is what's written down, so there would be nothing written down protecting the freedom of speech in that hypothetical. Natural law says you have certain rights that come from our humanity no matter what's written down. So let's extrapolate that to the Second Amendment. Suppose they did repeal the Second Amendment. Under Heller, you would still have the right to protect yourself because it's a natural right. It comes from our humanity. It's an extension of the ancient right to self-defense, and the government can't take that away from you. How that argument would fare in a federal court would would depend upon whether the judge or the justices studied natural rights when they were in law school, which most law students shy away from. Now, can you refresh our memories? My understanding was that Heller was a D.C. Uh, gun case based on the you know, the real difficulty that a D.C. resident has in purchasing or possessing or carrying a firearm within the District of Columbia itself. But I don't know that case uh, offhand in terms of the facts. Well, um, friends, uh, intellectual, ideological friends of yours and mine at the Cato uh, Institute found the perfect plaintiff, Heller himself, was, a reti- was an African-American retired District of Columbia police officer who was unable to get a permit to keep a gun in his house, not to carry it, but in his house. So you really had the perfect uh, plaintiff. What Justice Scalia and the majority uh, forgot was that this only applied 
their ruling in the District of Columbia and on federal property. So the same people that found Heller found McDonald, a retired African-American police officer in Chicago, and uh, brought an action against the state of Illinois. So Heller, the, the District of Columbia, establishes the right to, ca- to own and carry a weapon in your home in a federal jurisdiction. McDonald versus Illinois, an Alito opinion, Justice Samuel Alito opinion, establishes the same thing in the state jurisdictions everywhere in the United States. Neither ventures into what can you do when you're away from the home. That's the issue that's before the Supreme Court now. And do you think Heller will stand up? Do you think that... uh, the judges are human beings, and they're affected by the pressure when shooting events like this take place to do something? I, I, I Well, Heller is not before the court. The right to own in your right. home is not before the court. The right to carry outside your home is. If you're asking me if that decision will be affected by what happened in Texas, my opinion is absolutely not. In my opinion, that decision has already been written, and the majority, probably six to three, is not going to budge on this any more than they're going to budge on on abortion because of all the hoopla over the uh, uh, over the pilfered and leaked Alito opinion. The, the court is the anti-democrat. I, I know they're human beings and they, and they follow election returns and they have acid in their stomachs like the rest of us when they see babies being killed. But they're the anti-democratic branch uh, of the government that is not supposed to be moved by by the, the cultural political uh, attitudes of the public. What might individual states, especially blue states, try to do? Would, could, could some of them try to enact a so-called assault rifle ban on their own, and what might be their chances? Well, you know, when, uh, when the tragedy that we've almost forgotten now happened three weeks ago, Oh. The, the slaughter of innocents in, in the Buffalo supermarket, uh, the governor, amongst other crazy things she said when she blamed it on the Constitution and attacked the First Amendment and the Second, basically said, I don't know what the Supreme Court's going to do, but we're ready for you, Supreme Court. Now, that, of course, is a, is a childlike reaction on her part because the Supreme Court presumably will set down standards that she'll have to comply with. So it depends on how broad those standards are. If the standards don't affect uh, rounds, bullets, and magazines, the device that uh, holds the bullets, well, then the states will be free uh, to, uh, to limit those. New Jersey reduced the maximum uh, rounds from uh, 15 to 8. So the actual possession of a magazine, even empty and locked in a safe is a felony in New Jersey. You have to destroy those things or give them to the police. That's how draconian the statute is. I don't know if this Supreme Court opinion will will address that. I hope it does address that. Otherwise, you'll find the states doing all kinds of chicanery just to make it difficult and even miserable for people who lawfully and constitutionally own and carry guns to use them. Because as everybody knows, a gun without a round in it is useless. In fact, mm-hmm. it's dangerous. Now, I happen to know that you're a gun guy. You go and qualify at the range, and you keep your skills up in this sort of thing. In, in Judge Napolitano's world, how would we deal with these kinds of threats? What would be the way to provide security, let's say, at, a, at an elementary school? Well, first of all, it would be locked so that the killer was locked out rather than locked in and the police locked out. I mean, this is an extraordinary series of events that you couldn't have made up. But in my world, all adults could carry, including in a school zone. You know, there was a sign uh, about uh, 800 feet from the school saying you've entered a gun-free school zone. Those are the most dangerous places on earth. When I, in my podcast uh, yesterday, posted a sign in front of another school elsewhere in Texas, which said, uh, this school is protected by armed guards who will not hesitate to use their weapons to protect the children inside. 
that uh, judging podcast got over 500,000 hits because people were so moved by that sign. That's the kind of sign I'd put out there, and I would train the teachers, gym teachers. They might be ex-military. I'm not talking about an 8-year-old librarian. I'm talking about a 35-year-old gym or history teacher. I would train them the uh, weapon to protect the children's lives. You know, what's ironic here, Judge, is that you and I would certainly both agree, and, and our friends on the left, our gun-controlling friends, would agree that uh, private property owners, a vast space like Disney World or even a vast private HOA, you know, call it a maybe municipality almost in a sense, but a private gated community with an HOA, uh, a huge private uh, a building, an office building, a vast employer factory, any of these purely private property scenarios, the owner uh, certainly has the right not only to ban weapons, but to have you go through a metal detector or something prior to enter. I mean, I don't want to live in that world, yeah. but I would respect no, it. I don't want to. You're right. The private property owner can make those the choices. I, I was about to interview a congressman when I was at Fox was also a retired FBI agent. He was 15 minutes late. I said, what happened to you? He said, well, your goons out front, or ex-NYPD, knew that I was armed. And I told them, I'm ex-FBI, I'm an ex-congressman, and you're not going to get my gun. And they said, sorry, nobody carries a gun in the Fox hmm. building. So hand it over, congressman, or we're not letting you in. The private property owner makes that decision. That's one of the privileges of owning property. And, of course, the private property owner then is responsible for what happens on the property if the owner has uh, emasculated people from defending themselves. Mm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you need to be listening to the Judging Freedom podcast. You can find it on a variety of platforms, wherever you get your podcast. It is really almost your daily go-to on anything happening in the legal world. Judging Freedom is the podcast. You can find him on Twitter at Judge Knapp, and I really recommend you check out the podcast because this is a man uh, that the world needs to be listening to. We have to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to delve a little bit more into this topic with Ryan McMakin from the Mises Institute who's been actually covering some of the statistics behind school shootings, other types of mass shootings, and mass incidents of violence here in the U.S. And some of the statistics might surprise you when our European friends uh, talk about how violent and criminal uh, gun culture is in the U.S. It's, there's more to that than meets the eye. And actually, America's perhaps far safer than you think it is. This is News Talk 1040. we got to take a break. Thanks so much to Judge Andrew Napolitano. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Thank you, Jeff. everybody. This is A Neighbor's Choice. I am your substitute host, Jeff Dice, filling in for David Gornowski, as I often do, from 4 to 6. It's going to be 5 to 7 next week. We're going to be changing things up a little bit here at News Talk 1040 WHBO. A really fascinating discussion with Judge Andrew Napolitano. Re- really knows constitutional case law better than just about any human on earth. I recommend uh, that you follow him. But I want to stick with this terrible topic of the shooting in Texas earlier this week. And we're joined by a friend of mine, uh, an economist and editor at Mises.org, Ryan McMakin, who's been writing about some of the statistics behind gun violence in the U.S. this week at our site, Mises.org. So, Ryan, uh, great to talk to you, buddy. Jeff, good to be with you. You know, I noticed that whenever one of these terrible shootings occurs, that our friends on the left, and especially our friends in Europe, like to point out how violent America is and how many shootings there are. And so you wrote an article just yesterday titled, Just How Common Are School Shootings? You can find this at Mises.org, folks. 
And it turns out that the uh, statistics are not so clear and that maybe these shootings are actually uh, very, very rare when looked at correctly. Well, I remember seeing the, the news reports come out on the school shooting, and I was thinking, boy, when was the last time this happened, something of this magnitude? A lot of things that are listed as school shootings are um, a, uh, a, a suicidal student goes to school and shoots himself in the hall, or it's a, uh, a known uh, criminal with a juvenile record goes to school and robs someone and shoots them. And anything that happens on school property is listed as a school shooting, and those things can add up. And, of course, that was a big deal uh, in the 80s and 90s when there were lots of gang activity at schools and so on. But when people think of school shootings, they think of these incidents where some nut goes into the school with a gun and starts shooting uh, more than one or two people. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, boy, when was the last time that happened? The last time that happened was 2018 at Parkland. Uh, And then really before that, you have to go back to 2012 uh, at Sandy Hook. Uh, But when when you're getting old like me, you start to merge all these things in your mind that they all happened in the recent past. Plus, they're obviously very traumatic events, and, and they make big headlines. But the numbers of victims in these cases are incredibly small. So it seems like a very odd thing to discuss as a matter for national soul-searching when you start looking at the the actual numbers involved, that you've got uh, a country with 330 million people, and then in the worst years, you've got about 30 people who are killed in school shootings. Uh, which, when you look at the totals on these, is about point zero 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 five per 100,000 people, uh, and these are vanishingly small numbers. Uh, but because I think they, they give a feeling of dread to suburbanites, um, they, they are commonly used as a tactic uh, for the anti-gun lobby and for the left in general, uh, to create uh, a certain policy narrative. And so you get just a ton of play on these events, which everyone agrees are terrible, but uh, terrible things happen a lot. And so the question is, why, do, why just these events? Why did these events prompt matters for a national discussion, whereas lots of other horrible things that happen don't? Well, of course, I think part of the emotional response here, Ryan, might be when this happens in a school, It's a loss of innocence. We think uh, young people starting out in their lives is a tremendous tragedy for them to be killed as opposed to some 40 or 50 year old person being killed. And also that school ought to be a safe place. I mean, that's we ought to have a society that's not so insane that, you know, young men, let's just say, are shooting up their classmates. So I think it's more an emotional thing. Uh, rather than anything relating to the numbers. But nonetheless, as you point out, when it's being crafted as a narrative to drive policy, and particularly to take guns away or to limit guns or to limit ammunition or or to do whatever, uh, it's very, very dangerous in the days following a tragedy to sort of lash out and create some policy which might have far-reaching effects. Um, Well, why do you think it is that our European friends in particular are so, uh, uh, not, I don't want to say amused because that sounds cruel under these circumstances, but so aghast at, at our gun rules. I mean, this, this idea that America is the cowboy West, I think, has, is really deeply rooted in Europe. Well, Europe is a very, very different place uh, from the United States and from the rest of the America. The only, the only exception to that, actually, is Canada, which is a much smaller country, uh, has a much different ethnic makeup than the United States and the rest of the Americas, uh, especially in the United States. This is a very mobile society, a very fractured society, uh, a society that's nothing like uh, Europe. Uh, in terms of its uh, construction, where people live, how long they Mm -hmm. live there, the ideas of community and so on. And there really is uh, more violence in the United States because there really are more different groups that don't see others as uh, someone who is their neighbor, uh, who is uh, the same as them. And I think that helps to go a long way in terms of reducing violence. Uh, 
Uh, but, of course, what Europeans think is that, um, oh, it just must be because of these gun laws the Americans have. But, of course, it's easy to show why that's not the case. You could adopt gun laws like Mexico, which has extremely strict gun laws, um, and uh, they don't work there at all. And in terms of the factors that I just spoke about, in terms of how a country has been settled and where people live and how mobile they are and how different groups view each other, the United States has a lot more in common with Latin America and with Mexico than it does uh, with Europe. And if, in fact, if you look at American border towns, they're some of the safest places in America. And so it's just really bizarre then to try and reduce everything to this one policy issue when we can look at many, many examples and see that that's simply not the case. Uh, and I've done some uh, analyses for Mises.org as well, showing that actually the U.S. and Europe, as well as Canada, all follow a similar trajectory in terms of crime throughout the 20th century, and that uh, the acceleration of gun control laws uh, in European countries in Canada really had no effect on the trajectory of crime in those places. This is especially true in the United Kingdom, where gun control, or rather where crime, homicides, plummeted uh, way back in the early, early 20th century. And it, gun control wasn't established at all in the country until after that, when it was established as, uh, it, it was part of a, a red scare, a panic over uh, foreigners who would come in and murder everybody. And so it was only then, after gun crime had gone down significantly, that the English started uh, introducing these sorts of laws. And so to try and create a connection there between European homicide and their gun laws just really has no basis in the actual timeline. It would probably be good for parents especially who worry, as we all do, all of us who are parents, we worry endlessly about our kids, to know, as you point out in this article, things like drunk driving and car accidents in general and suicide, sadly, uh, drowning, cancer, child abuse, statistically, these are all far greater threats to our children than, than having a school shooting event. Well, you say people, of course, want schools to be safe, but of course we also think that a child's home should be safe. But while in a year that you might have 30 school shooting deaths, you have 1,800 child abuse deaths at, uh, at the hands of adults, not necessarily oh, wow. their own parents. Mm -hmm. And why aren't we hearing about uh, need for comprehensive federal regulation to do something about child abuse? I think that right there really shows uh, the fact that this is not about actually keeping children safe. This is about a fetish that the left has long had with gun control, and uh, it's something where they can portray themselves as caring deeply about children whereas things like child abuse are, are just perennially ignored in the Congress. Not that I think Congress is the right place to make laws on child abuse, and the same is true of guns. Congress is really not a place for domestic policy at all. Uh, but it's, it's, it's curious how it's always gun control legislation that keeps kids safe, and many of the other things that lead to the deaths of children apparently are of no concern. Yes, that is interesting. I think that's an excellent point about child abuse, for example, as horrific as that might be. And, of course, our friends on the right, they will take this opportunity to point out, for instance, hey, there's more, far more gun violence in Chicago in the span of a year than there are uh, killings in schools. But I think the dirty little secret there is a lot of that gun violence in cities takes place strictly in certain neighborhoods and people feel like they can avoid that whereas this you know a shooting in a school or a mall or a church or synagogue people feel like they're in a safe place when this happens so it's very disconcerting and you can understand how and why politicians exploit this we got to take a quick yeah, break this is uh, this is that's... uh this is i'm sorry right we'll be we got to take a quick break this is news talk 1040 we'll come right back and get uh, ryan's follow-up thoughts to that question stay with us this is WHBO. We are back. Wrapping up the show with Ryan McMakin. 
economist and senior editor at the Mises Institute. Now, Ryan, one thing you point out in this article that we were touching on right before the break was that only a tiny fraction of 1% of gun homicides in America are school shootings. So it's a very, very tiny thing. But if you look at the county-by-county county breakdown, you know, so many gun homicides happen in particularly uh, poor or violent counties. And so average people feel pretty safe out there. If you're not in a bad neighborhood, your chances of being murdered by a gun in the United States are actually quite, quite low. Yeah, location makes a big difference. And we can see that even at the state level, right? If we look at homicide rates by state, uh, you can see that a number of states that have basically unrestricted gun access have some of the lowest homicide rates. So I'm talking uh, uh, northern New England, for example, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, basically no gun laws, extremely low homicide rates, like one or two per 100,000. Uh, the same is true uh, of, say, Utah, of Idaho, uh, the, and, of course, uh, Oregon, which compared to the U.S. has relatively strict gun laws, but not compared to most of the world, and same with Minnesota. These places all have very low homicide rates, as in entire states. And one point that might be made is that when people say, oh, look at Canada, look how low their homicide rates. Well, actually, if you look at U.S. states that have demographics and climates similar to Canada, they have much lower homicide rates. Uh, I, I, I don't know what to make of that exactly, but uh, it calls uh, into question this idea that, uh, yep, we can speak of an American homicide rate or something like that. But, of course, if we looked at it then by state by state, we could look at a state that has kind of a middle homicide rate, but even then we, we find that, as you say, it's limited to only a couple of cities or metro areas. And I, back in 2020, I did an analysis of this specifically for the state of Virginia, because at the time there was a lot of discussion about new gun laws in Virginia and this idea that, oh, Virginia is a wash in guns and there's just homicide everywhere. Uh, if you look at what you find uh, is that a majority of Virginia homicides come from only two metro areas. And uh, if you look mm. at uh, the Richmond and Virginia Beach metros back in 2018, that was the day that was available at the time, 222 homicides. The entire rest of the state, 169 homicides. So, yeah. I mean, this is really quite remarkable. So <laughs> just, and even if you then break down those metro areas, you're talking about uh, certain neighborhoods. And this this idea then that, Oh, that most Americans wake up in the morning wondering if they're going to be shot on the way to work. Some Americans may think that, uh, but uh, in most cases, it's a completely misplaced idea. And, of course, feeling of safety is uh, one of the most arbitrary things, so that doesn't really tell us anything about actual uh, safety in countries. And if you do look at some of the international data, you can see that Americans do often feel that they're not even safe in suburban areas, which is which is pretty much absurd, given mm -hmm. where most of these, these people are actually living. But, Pete, you've got people trained to not walk through a suburban park at night because they're convinced that they'll be mugged or raped or worse in those places. And when we look at the actual data related to this sort of thing, your, your chances of uh, violent crime happening to you in those settings is basically zero. So you need to have some sense of not only is it even uniform among states at the state level, you could just move to Utah and your chances of being a victim of violent crime are nothing. Uh, but it, once you get into states, even some states that have fairly high homicide rates, just avoid certain cities uh, and specific, and by city, I mean even like a specific incorporated city, not even an entire metro area. And your odds are uh, extremely, extremely low of being uh, a victim of violent crime. And and when so when you have discussions in Congress about the nation is a wash in guns, or a nation has a homicide crisis or a school shooting crisis, that that really just means nothing at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and America is so vast. And it has such dense uh, urban cities and then such sparsely populated areas like Alaska and Wyoming. It really is crazy to compare our statistics to a lot of countries in Europe. You know, some of these countries in Europe are talking about gun deaths, and they have uh, 5 or 10 or even 20 or 30 million people versus our 330 million. So it, it really is unfortunate. But nonetheless, Ryan, here's the thing is that we're uh, emotional creatures every bit as much as we're rational creatures, probably more so. 
uh, we're controlled by our hindbrains, and po- politicians are very good at taking events like this and turning them into an opportunity. So the risk for most of us out there listening across Tampa Bay, the risk is not uh, necessarily being the victim of a shooting. The risk is uh, what the federal government might do to your ability to possess a gun. And that's, I, I guess, I just don't know how we get past this media industrial complex where these things are, uh, you know, turned into uh, paroxysms uh, 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 for the American people that we all, you know, lose our minds over something that really, if you can just dial back and look at some of the statistics you provided, uh, however horrifying, are are not um, something which define America at all. Well, and you can look at some of the solutions being offered, right? The, the problem is assault rifles. It's these weapons of war. I was just looking at the FBI data today on weapons, uh, on victimizations by weapon, classified by weapon, right? And since the end of the assault weapon ban, there's no increase in the number of rifles being used in homicides. In fact, some of the worst rates were... Uh, back in the 80s, which isn't surprising, those days of rampant uh, gang violence and so on. But even then, about, what, 4.5% of your homicide victims were victimized by rifles. And really, in recent years, it's been more about 2%, 3%. Uh, let's see, when in 2020, it was 2.5%. Um, and back in 2000, when the assault weapon ban was in place, it was 2.9%. And so these were... <laughs> If that's, if that's what you're obsessing over is assault weapons and the problem you're trying to address is homicide, uh, that's, there's just really not much of a connection there at all. But you can just throw these things out when you're making a political speech and stuff, and people, of course, aren't going to look up whatever point it is you're trying to make, so it just doesn't really matter. You know, over the past few years, there's been a pretty remarkable shift on the right where a lot of these institutions which uh, conservatives used to admire, the FBI, the CIA, uh, even the U.S. military, have been uh, somewhat exposed as having left-wing agendas and very bureaucratic and woke and uh, political and aligned against Trump. And so there's been some real wakings. I heard Dennis Prager, of all people, a baby boomer, recently on the radio saying, you know, I was wrong about the FBI. And that's a pretty big admission for, you know, an older conservative like him to make. I wonder, given the police malfeasance at this event this week, uh, not only not going in and, and, uh, and you know, uh, finding the guy and stopping the guy, but keeping parents out, I wonder if this might be the beginning of a shift on the right towards just this sort of uh, reflexive, uh, support for police and the thin blue line and all that. I mean, we start to see police are really just kind of bureaucrats who don't always have uh, our interests at heart, to put it mildly. Yeah, and let's not forget that this is not the first time. Uh, back in the 80s, there was a, a, a shooting, a standoff at a McDonald's uh, where uh, the police waited an hour to go in in that case. That's one of the earlier cases I could find. But let's look at specifically school shootings. Right. Uh, the the current standard operating procedure is you are supposed to go in and engage. And why did they have to explicitly say that? Because at Columbine in 1999, people made the mistake of thinking that the sheriff's department of Jefferson County would actually do something to save children from mass shooters. And what did they do? Uh, they put a they formed a perimeter around Columbine High School and sat outside for two hours. In fact, they sat outside for an hour after the shooters had committed suicide because the police were hmm well i think we might have lost ryan's connection but the point that mr mcmakin was making is that mr mcmakin was making is that he, the supreme court has actually ruled that police and other public servants have no legal duty to protect you per se so what this generally means, uh, in the sense of uh, perhaps suing your local police for malfeasance or for a failure to protect you, is that you're going to have a hard time um, under the doctrine of sovereign immunity, which already makes it difficult to sue your local police, uh, to take action on that. Uh, so it's, it's interesting when we think that 
uh, if there are two institutions which conservatives and people on the right have supported reflexively for years, the U.S. military is certainly one, and local police are certainly that as well. And I don't want to take this opportunity to bash police. I mean, we're still getting facts about what happened in Texas, uh, what the police did and, more importantly, did not do. Uh, they have admitted that mistakes were made. There's a lot of angry parents, so we do see probably that this is going to lead to an investigation, and it's probably going to come out looking pretty bad for the local police and the local SWAT team for not taking action and for allowing this tragedy to go to unfold over a period of apparently more than an hour. And I think that's going to leave a black eye not only on local police, but it's going to affect uh, the perception of police, I think, somewhat around the country do we still have the kind of heroes that run into a burning building on 9 11 for example first responders well it remains to be seen it's it's a serious question and a good one but if police are not really there to protect us the question becomes who is and most people would say well that's me i got to protect myself and i would suggest that this kind of thing might actually backfire on the gun controllers that they might take a look at the world and decide, hey, look, I don't know why there's so many crazy, violent young men out there, but there are. And uh, we got to protect ourselves. We got to protect our kids. Maybe we need to put some teachers or some guards or whoever in schools uh, to deal with this sort of thing in the future. I mean, people aren't just going to sit by uh, and wait for police to do nothing. So it's a sober week. Don't want to make light of this, but I think it's important that we uh, don't rush to produce new gun control legislation in the wake of these tragedies, but think about what we're doing uh, and act rationally so that we don't create unintended consequences, so that we don't leave uh, people defenseless against criminals. I want to thank everybody for joining us on WHBO 1040. I hope you have a great weekend, three-day weekend. I want to thank Ryan McMakin and Jonathan Newman and Judge Andrew Napolitano for joining us. And we'll be back next week. You want to listen to David Gornoski all week, but instead of 4 to 6, he will be 5 to 7 all next week on A Neighbor's Choice. Thanks for joining us. Have a beautiful holiday weekend, and we'll talk to you next week.